Welcome and thank you for listening to this lecture on challenges and advances in simulating convective extreme events. My name is Andreas Bryan. I'm a researcher at the National Center for Atmospheric Research at the Capacity Center for Weather and Climate Extremes. And in the next 30 minutes, I will walk you through what convective extreme events are, how we are able to simulate them, and what the major challenges are that we are facing in, in predicting and projecting them into the future. So starting off with what are convective extreme events and why are they important? So this is a range of, of um, extremes that I will talk about. Um, convective extremes are mostly high winds in the form of straight line wind, for example, as the ratios, uh, flash flooding, so very intense downpours, pours of, of water that can cause major flash floodings, uh, lightning strikes, tornadoes, um, hail in every size up to really giant hail, as it's shown here. And um, those events can also trigger landslides, if uh, specifically the heavy rain events. So flash flooding and landslides are often connected with, e with each other. So why, why are those important? Why should we care? If you look at insurance data, you can see that um, losses from convective extreme events are on the rise. This is showing here from Munich Re for North America. And you can see um, in current years, we are close to or above $20 billion each year that we lost, uh, lose because of um, convective extreme events. And uh, the picture looks very similar for um, Europe as well. So if you look at different perils, um, loss categories, you can see that uh, convective weather is one of the most um, expensive extreme events in the US. This is from uh, the NOAA Storm Events Database, the statistic, statistic that I'm showing you here. And that's why actually in insurance industry and also economists are really interested in, in this spe specific type of extreme events. So how often do they happen? Um, again, this is um, the NOAA Storm Report data set here. I have a link down here if you want to check it out. It's a really nice website. Um, during the summer season, so this is showing you a um, May 2017 picture here, um, extreme, convective extreme events are happening basically on a daily basis in the US. Um, what, what's showing here is in red, um, red markers are tornado reports. So we had a few tornadoes on this, on this day on the East Coast, high wind reports. And again, like these are the blue markers. And you can see often these convective extreme events are clustering and happening um, close together. Uh, these are similar storms that cause tornadoes and high winds. And then hail, we had a few hail reports, even in the Western US. And um, on this day in the total, we had 53 reports. So these are basically people that report these events and then they um, get into the status database and you can look at the database. I'll show you some more statistics later on. So this is for um, the 5th of May, this is the 6th of May, so you can see now the East Coast extremes um, basically are gone, but we have quite widespread high wind events across the Western US. And the 7th moves even further east. And then this is the 8th. So we have a, a large range of hail reports in the front range. So from Colorado, New Mexico specifically. And this was, I'm mentioning this because I'm, I'm living in Boulder, Colorado. So this was very close to us. There was a massive hailstorm hitting Denver, Colorado, which cost um, 1.4 billion US dollars. Um, so you can see a picture here of, of this really great massive hailstones that fell out of this storm. Um, so this is a really good website and I think it's a very nice example to show you um, how frequent those events are happening and um, how they are clustering together. So next, I wanted to talk about approaches to model convective extreme events. So if, if we talk about modeling extremes, severe convective storms, which are shown in the bottom left here, are really the, the one extreme event that's hardest to model and least understood how they're changing into the future under climate change conditions. They are also extremely hard to predict in numerical weather forecasting systems. So what is showing here is a graphic from NOAA. Um, the further right you are, 
the better of an understanding we have of how climate change affects a specific extreme event. And the higher you are on the y-axis, the more confidence we have in the human contribution to changes in this extreme event. So it's basically showing you how how well we understand the events and how well we can attribute changes to um, man-made climate change. So as I said, severe convective storms are in this lower end um, combined with wildfires. And the upper end is um, very basically large-scale extremes that la last longer, like heat, heat waves, extreme heat, or extreme cold events and droughts. So there's an urgent need to better understand how severe convective storms might change under future conditions. And we have several approaches um, that we can use to, to do such research. Um, so there are, I think there are two general approaches that you can distinguish to get to severe convective hazard information. The first one is statistical modeling, which basically uses um, relationships between large scale um, synoptic scale features and the hazard that you want to investigate. And the second one is dynamical downscaling, which basically uses a, a, high resolu a higher resolution model to get more information um, about the event that you're interested in. Um, the statistical model, as I said, you use the fa favorable large scale environments to um, derive information about extremes um, with the dynamical downscaling. There are two additional approaches which is one, basically the hazard is explicitly modeled. I will talk about this a little bit more later on. Or the hazard is not really uh, explicitly modeled, but the environment is better modeled than in the original data set. I will talk about both of those in a second. But let's start with, I think, the, the computationally um, least um, expensive approach, which is the statistical modeling. So this is a nice early example by Brooks et al. 1994, uh, where they were interested in which environments uh, produce specific uh, kinds of convective storms. Those that produce torna tornadoes, those that produce no tornadoes, or those that produce extreme winds, so that are not tornado-related winds. So what you see here is the updraft helicity which is basically a measurement of how much rotation you have in the updraft. And rotation in the updraft is a good proxy for, um, like, the more rotation you have, the higher risk of a tornado, the higher risk of um, large hail you have generally. Uh, then they, they looked at the maximum mixing ratio in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see, like, those, those two things are loosely correlated, but the, the interesting thing that they found is that most tornadic storms happened within these two dashed lines. So in this um, environmental area um, where you have, I would say, medium helicity and medium um, moisture in the atmosphere, and those two are somehow related linearly. Uh, beneath this environment um, are non-tornadic storms, and above the environment you have extreme wind-producing storms. So you can use this kind of relationships to basically understand how often do this environment occur and how um, how does the frequency of the occurrence of these environments change in the future. So there are a few pros and cons of this. The first one is definitely this is a very cheap approach. You can do this on your desktop computer without any supercomputing resources. Uh, and these environments can potentially be reliably produced by fairly coarse resolution models. So again, you can use a global climate model, for example, and look at those environments, and you probably get a more or less good estimate of uh, how these environments might change. Um, the, the, the negative here is, is really it's neglecting a typical situation. So, for example, you had a tornado over here or down here, so you don't you don't get those. You miss those definitely. And I think that the biggest drawback here is that it's assuming stationarity. So um, you can think of if the if climate change um, changes the environmental setting, this relationship might break down because they are based on historic data. And this historic databases or um, events are maybe not really applicable into the future. So this is generally the drawback of the statistical approaches. There are 
many papers and this is just a small subset of those that use that for each of those events that i introduced at the beginning i listed at least two papers that use this approach so you can have a look at those and get an understanding and find uh, many more of them but those are a good introduction in how this um, statistical relationship environmental ingredients based uh, risk estimates are working So coming back to this overview, now we will focus on the dynamical downscaling approaches. So we, we are looking at those two branches down here. So traditionally, if you look at global climate models, they are operating on the like, state-of-the-art models that you find, for example, in the CMIP-6 archive are, are operating on the order of 100 kilometer grid spacing. So these are the more high resolution models. The problem that you have if you operate on such coarse grids is that if you have convective clouds, they are much smaller than the grid cell that you have in your model. So you have to use um, cumulus parameterization schemes. So basically you have to parameterize how these clouds look like based on properties that you simulate in the model. For example, convective available potential energy. Um, the problem that we have with these convective convection parameterization schemes is that they are fairly unreliable and they have systematic errors and produce major uncertainties in our future climate change projections. So in weather forecasting, we know since quite a while, more than two decades, that if we go to high resolution, uh, we get a much more rely reliable model simulation of convective clouds than with this very coarse resolution model. So what you basically do with... This is called statistic, uh, the dynamical downscaling. You, you um, split this coarse resolution grid cell into finer um, pieces. This is, for example, if you would have um, a model with 25 kilometer grid, grid cells, which is basically the, like we had high res MIP simulations in the last IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change um, report, the sixth assessment report. Those were the highest resolution global climate simulations that we had. And um, regional climate modeling ensembles are often operating around this scale, 25 kilometers. But you can still see convection, like these clouds are still smaller than the grid cell. So you still rely on um, deep convective parameterization. You really have to go down to something like four kilometers. This is approximately the grid that you have to use um, to resolve the, the, the really the big updrafts and downdrafts in the systems and to resolve um, the bulk of these clouds. Um, this, like Weissman, for for example, at all 1997 is a good introduction into this. So generally, if you want, like we, we're talking about modeling across scales, and I already started talking about this in my last slide. So we have, have this traditional global climate models. They are operating on scales um, from 100 kilometers or larger. Then we have regional models, which are somewhere in the range between 10 kilometers and, and larger. And then this, this new type of models, which we call here convection permitting models, they often refer to as cloud resolving models or storm resolving models as well. Those are really the ones that where you don't need a cumulus parameterization scheme anymore. And the big difference that you get here, this is from a paper by uh, Morrison et al. 2020, is that um, in these models, at least you have under-resolved, they call this under-resolved clouds, but you, you have a much better simulation of especially deep convective clouds than what you get in these two uh, simulations. So you have under-resolved clouds. Um, and if you, if you want to resolve the clouds better, and specifically the turbulence within the clouds, <clears throat> which is shown here, you would have to use large eddy simulations, which are shown up here, which range between something like several meters to 100 kilometer. Um, so these are very high resolution models. And you can take even another step um, further and simulate processes on the order of millimeters to meters with what we call DNS simulation, direct numerical simulations. So those simulations now can really simulate um, single hydrometeors like cloud, cloud droplets. So these are extremely high resolution, very expensive. So the further you go to the left, the more expensive your simulation will get. I come back to this in a second. But looking back at this extreme events that we have here that I introduced at the beginning, I wanted you to guess like, or 
at least make an educated guess which kind of model you would need to explicitly simulate the extreme event, not the environment, but really simulate the specific hazard that we're interested in. So this is um, how this looks like with convection permitting models, you can actually simulate um, downpours fairly well. Um, so the heavy rainfall areas um, are fairly well simulated. The high wind events are fairly well simulated as well. And like with this heavy downpours, you could use those precipitation estimates to also simulate landslides fairly well. So you can do this pretty well, like um, higher resolution would make um, the simulation better, but you can still fairly well do this with um, simulations that have on the order of a few kilometer grid spacing. Uh, however, if you want to simulate a tornado, for example, you would definitely need fairly high resolution large eddy simulations. I will show you an example of that in a second. And if you want to simulate hail and lightning, you would have to do explicitly, you would have to, to use uh, DNS simulations. This is at the moment not really possible because these, these simulations, these DNS simulations are very small regions. Like you can see this ranges up to a meter in scale so you have maybe a cubic meter a few cubic meters of volume that you can simulate and you would have to simulate an entire cloud deep convective cloud to to simulate um, the growth of hail for example um, but this is approximately how this looks like what i wanted to show you next is a really stunning simulation where people used um, a large eddy simulation to explicitly uh, simulate a tornadic tornadic supercell uh, thunderstorm. So this is uh, was done <clears throat> at UWSSEC, and you can see um, here the volume of the thunderstorm that was simulated. So this is the cloud that you see from the top. This is how um, the cloud looks from the bottom, and you can clearly see this funnel, the the tornado that touched down. Um, so they, they, I think this is a 10, 10 meter resolution simulation. And this was really the first time that I saw that somebody explicitly simulated a torna tornado in a numerical model. So this is, a, this is currently actually possible in experimental mode, a numerical weather forecast. This would be way too expensive to do for numerical weather forecasting. But it's stunning, I think, that we have models and computers now that allow us to simulate these kind of features at this high resolution.
So what I wanted to talk about, what I wanted to talk about next is really focusing more on this convection permitting models, because these are the models that we really can use. This is basically the cutting edge of climate change research that we currently have. This is, we have enough, enough computational resources to run these kind of models for several decades of a fairly large domain. So they can be really used to understand, better understand how these kind of um, convective extreme events might change into the future. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you these are some idealized simulations of organized convective storms, which are called mesoscale convective systems. And I wanted you to show, um, to show you how these kind of storms look like um, when you step through uh, various grid spacings in the model. So going from what we call the mesoscale limit, this is the area where you have to, or most, like most people use deep convective parameterization schemes. Then you get into this kilometer scale, this convection permitting area, which is called terra incognita here, because we partly resolved the turbulence spectrum, which is shown in the background here, but not fully. So this is a gray zone for um, turbulence. But in this area, you, you definitely have large improvements in how you simulate deep convective storms. And then this is a large eddy simulations that I introduced before, like the tornado simulation that we saw, where you explicitly simulate turbulence in your model and you don't need a turbulence parameterization anymore. So this is a storm um, that was triggered back here. As I said, it's an idealized simulation and it moves with the upper level flow. So we're looking at the cloud from the top um, and you can see there's a single updraft that develops and propagates um, towards us. So this is, if you study organized convective storms, this is not really what you want to, want to see. There is no real organization. You only have a single storm, a single updraft that's moving with the, with the flow. This is what you get at four kilometers. So it's, it's <clears throat> quantitatively really a different simulation. So uh, you can see now you have several updrafts. You have a, a, a front that's developing a line of convection, which, which is triggering additional updrafts. And also the cloud field looks different. Even the motion of the storm is different if you go from 12 to four kilometers. This looks way, way, way closer to what we see in the real atmosphere than what you get from 12 kilometers. However, of course, you can Im improve upon that. You can use higher resolution simulations. And now, for example, this is comparing the four to the one kilometer. And you see that in the one kilometer, you get smaller updrafts. So these are fairly large bubbles of air that arise up here. Those are better resolved. And you see also that um, the cloud shield looks a little bit different. But qualitatively, the difference between four kilometers and one kilometer is way smaller than if you go from um, 12 kilometers to four kilometers, what I showed you before. And then we can compare one kilometer to 250 meter simulations. So this is really on the edge of large eddy simulations now. And what you see here is you can clearly see that there's more turbulence. If you look at the cloud shield here, it's fairly smooth. There's mostly white. And here we see lots of this gray shadings, which basically shows you that we have a lot of turbulent motions in these clouds. And you see this, this, this front is very well defined. But the problem here is really that if you go from left to right, the computational in, in resources that you need are in, increasing rapidly. So that's why uh, sticking with the coarsest resolution that you that you that allows you to simulate the extreme event um, characteristics well is a is a good idea because this will allow you to run longer simulations and get a larger ensemble of of cases that you can analyze. So this is um, the same simulation is just showing you a snapshot of precipitation, how the precipitation field looks like in these storms. <clears throat> and you can see the same um, shift between 12 kilometer simulations. We did one with um, a kind fridge scheme, which is a deep convective scheme and one without deep convective with without a deep convective scheme. You see those two, you lose a little bit of this weak precipitation up here, but those two look fairly similar. And then once you go to four kilometers, um, you have really a fundamentally different looking precipitation um, pattern, which looks fairly similar even if you go down to 250 meters. So you get lots of the um, benefits of two, 250 meters you already get at four kilometer, at, at least if you're interested in the bulk properties of, of your precipitation. This is also seen in, in this in this plots here. For example, the track difference, if you compare how this systems track over time, <clears throat> between the 250 meter simulations, the reference uh, up to four kilometers, you, you, you 
you you can predict the track very very well but as but with 12 kilometers um no matter if you use a cumulus scheme or not the track is fairly far off so again you see the step change once you go from 12 kilometer to 4 kilometer you have a much better simulation uh, this is showing you the same thing for the maximum precipitation, so the peak precipitation um, within the system. And those are fairly similar between 250 meters and 4 kilometers. And then very different if you go to 12 kilometers. That's the same thing when you look at the stratiform precipitation, which is basically everything that's blue in here. We see that the stratiform is fairly similar up to 4 kilometers, and then it's, it's highly underestimated in the 12 kilometer simulations. So there are, there are four major approaches that you can use to go to convect, convection permitting scales. The most popular one, <clears throat> probably the most affordable one at the moment, um, is using limited area models. Where you basically use a coarse resolution model and then you have a boundary where you nest a high resolution model in, in the coarse resolution model. And you can repeat that several times to go to higher and higher resolution. So here, for example, we have um, two, two nested um, regional models within the global model to get to very high resolution uh, over a small region. Alternatively, this is the, I think the, um, the most expensive approach, but <clears throat> probably the most um, valuable in the future uh, using global convection permitting simulations. So you basically simulate the whole globe um, with very high resolution. Uh, there are several modeling systems that can do this that are in um, basically testing mode at the moment. And we can run already a few years of these simulations uh, with the current supercomputers that we have. An alternative to that is what we call super parameterizations. <clears throat> basically, you have a, a coarser resolution global model in which e in, within each of the grid cells of the coarse resolution model, you nest a, a cloud model at much higher resolution. So this is basically a hybrid where you have coarse resolution uh, globally, but then a high resolution model running within each of these grid cells. That's way more expensive than traditional deep convection parameterizations, but it's way cheaper than, for example, the global um, convection permitting simulations themselves. And finally, we have stretch grid models. Um, these are models that can have coarse resolution in some regions of the world and then seamlessly increase the grid spacing to have very high resolution over a specific region. So going down to convection permitting simulations, we have several modeling systems nowadays as well that can do this. So one, one of the challenges that we have when we use convection permitting models is <clears throat> uh, the model physics. Um, many of the model physics that we use for climate applications are basically taken from numerical weather forecasting models. So um, many of them are developed for numerical weather forecasting and we adapt them and run them in our climate change applications. One of the problems that we have here is really it's hard to, to test those, um, those um, parameterizations on climate timescales because it's so in expensive. So um, I think one um, parameterization that bears quite a lot of uncertainty in convection permitting modeling is uh, the microphysics. <clears throat> Since we don't use a deep convection parameterization anymore, all of the precipitation in your model, once you go to convection permitting scales, is coming from the microphysics. And you need much more complicated microphysics schemes um, because you, you resolve the clouds much better and you have very complex physical processes within the clouds, which are um, have to deal with liquid particles, frozen particles, and mixed phase um, areas in the cloud, which, which like interactions which are very complicated. This is again a, a picture from um, Morris et al. 2020, which uh, illustrates this very, very nicely, how complex these interactions are. The th second thing I wanted to mention here as turbulence, I already touched on this. Um, we are in the turbulent gray zone with with these convection permitting simulations on a few kilometers <clears throat> where we don't have a solid theory how to treat um, turbulent motions. So turbulence is heavily under-resolved in these simulations and we, we get systematic biases because of that. Um, so there's, there's an urgent need as well to improve our turbulence schemes or how, the, the way we simulate or deal with turbulence in this gray zone area that we, 
probably will rely on in fo weather forecasting and climate research for quite a long time from here on. The next thing, which is slightly related, is shallow convection. So uh, I talked about deep convective storms quite a bit here, but we also have, of course, much smaller scale shallow convective clouds. And those are very important, not, not really for precipitation normally, but for um, radiation and, and energy budget at the surface. And simulating those shallow convective clouds in kilometer scale models is, again, it's a challenge because they are subgrid scale. So we you can use a shell convection scheme, which can introduce um, uns uncertainties in your simulation. Um, and there's definitely research needed here in this area to have a better uh, theory and a better way of simulating shallow convective clouds in convection permitting models. And last but not least, there are, of course, <clears throat> connections to other Earth system components. I'm mentioning soil atmosphere coupling here, but the same is true for um, actually for ocean atmosphere coupling as well, or coupling to other components like sea ice and land ice. Um, but this is a really nice study by Mike Balage, which which was very eye, was really eye opening for me, where they showed that land atmosphere coupling fundamentally changes if you go to high resolution, and the the reason for that is what they showed in this in this figure nicely is once you resolve the topography of your land surface better, you get lateral flow of groundwater and you get areas with very shallow groundwater tables, which are these blue areas here. And you have lots of evaporation in these areas. And this is fundamentally different from a coarse resolution uh, model, which is not resolving this shallow area. So you get very different surface energy balances and have actually very strong feedback on the atmosphere in the temperature and the precipitation in regions. Um, so again, like this is, I think, an active research topic, and I think this coupling to other Earth system components is, is a very interesting area um, to focus on in the next couple of years. So um, I have a few more points to it. The last one I wanted to say is uh, talk about is computational challenges. So coming back to this figure that I showed you before from Morrison et al. 2020, um, which illustrates this point really nicely. One of the most expensive things you can change in your model setup is the grid spacing. So if you increase your grid spacing by a factor of two, you increase the computational costs of your simulations by approximately a factor of 10. So just to illustrate this, um, if you run a one year long, one kilometer global simulation, you use a approximately the same amount of computational resources uh, that you can that you can use to run a 10 kilometer model for a thousand years so there's a there's a massive trade-off so it's it's really you're trading a simulation length or a sample size versus resolution and there's a, a very steep trade-off so I think it's really important to be aware of that and to be aware of which grid spacing do you really need and what is your research question that you want to answer and then select the model grid spacing accordingly. I think one, one thing that we really have to focus on is to how we can bridge the scale gaps that we have. So most of our climate change assessments are relying on this very coarse resolution models, whereas we have additional uh, simulations, especially at convective permitting scales, but also increasingly on large eddy scales that are really not well connected to this large scale climate change estimate. So I think we really have to find better ways to work together across these different communities and to bridge the scale gap and information gap between them. I think machine learning, for example, could be a very promising way of doing this. Um, and there are several studies out there that, that try to attempt this and have uh, very promising results. The last point that I wanted to say is we only not only have computational challenges <clears throat> and physics challenges, we also have observational challenges. And this is shown here, um, again, looking at the NOAA storm report data set now specifically for hail larger than one inch in diameter. This is a map that shows you the frequency of, of such hail observations across the United States. You can clearly see there some distinct hotspots, especially in the central U.S., which are well known, um, but also, for example, here in the southeastern U.S. 
But the interesting thing is if you look at these maps, you can clearly eyeball bigger cities out of them. Um, if you look at um, the temporal evolution of hail reports over time from 1980 till current, you can see that there's a strong increase in reports over time. So naively, you could say, oh, this is climate change and climate change is increasing the frequency of um, severe hail. But that's that's not really the case. This trend is mainly because of changes in observational practice and reporting. Nowadays, there are many more people that report large hail reports than in the 80s. And that's the same reason why we have more hail, hail reports closer to cities than in rural areas. And you can actually, if you look at the distribution of these reports, you can clearly see highways and big cities in, in their reporting practice. So we, we miss many of the reports many of the events that happen in between in between roads and in between cities um, and you be, have to be very aware of the, this deficiencies in um, observing convective specifically tornadoes and hail but also other um, convective extreme events here's just a few references of uh, data sets that you can look at to um, to study um, convective extreme events um, from dis different perspectives. Um, yeah, go ahead and take take a look at those if you're interested and be aware of the deficiencies that I just mentioned before. So just a two, few takeaways before I end. So the first one is really severe convective storms or convective extreme events have um, very large impacts on the economy and um, society. Um, and we are not doing a really good job in simulating those events in current models. Um, it's also the, how these kind of extreme events are changing with climate change is also fairly unknown um, to a large extent. Um, so I think this, that's why this area is, is really a, a future growth area where um, if you search for a good topic to study, I think this is really promising and it's a fast growing area. Uh, and our modeling capabilities and computational resources are really getting to a point where we can address this very efficiently. But there are still like many challenges that we have to um, address, such as, for example, the observational challenges that I just mentioned. Um, high resolution modeling, like um, the models that we have, all have pros and cons and how we, we combine those, um, those those benefits of different modeling systems is, is not really clear yet. And of course, this also just physically um, a process understanding is not always sufficient to um, what we would need to really build better models. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. If you have some, um, please write me an email and I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Bye.